Hi guys, this is Professor Stugard, and today we are going to be taking a look at the uh, majors and money data set from 538 and basically continue on with our investigation that we started previously on this data set uh, and, and try to answer a few more questions looking at and how does your choice of major affect your uh, median expected salary at the end and your potential employment status. Um, so the first things to do is, of course, make sure we load our packages. So make sure you install and load Tidyverse and 538. Uh, make sure you do both of those. And then also make sure you download the markdown file from our Blackboard course shell called Majors and Money 2. Upload that and then have that open here in your editor as well. Uh, if you haven't done that yet, pause the video and course install and load those packages and upload the markdown file all right once you've gotten that done uh, if you remember from last time we did have one major in the data set that was missing some data uh, so we definitely want to get rid of that we want to make sure we get rid of that missing data so uh, I included the code here college recent grads uh, we want to drop any of the ones with the NA I ran that down there in my console, and not only does that drop the NA result, it brings the college recent grads into my environment as a data frame or as a tibble. So now we have our data frame to work with. Now we can go on to the first question, which the first question, we're going to investigate whether the number of graduates in each major is going to make a difference to your salary once you graduate. So. The first thing I want to do here is figure out, well, what is the major with the smallest number of graduates? What is the major with the median number of graduates, meaning the one that's right in the middle, right? If you, you ordered them from biggest to smallest, which one would be right in the middle? And then which is, which is the uh, major with the highest number of graduates? So we're starting with our college recent grads data frame. So we'll start with that. We want to pipe it into our summarize function, because again, we're trying to find some summary stats about this data frame. Uh, and we want, so the minimum value, and again, I'll call that min. Remember, we should definitely uh, title what we want our summary stats to be, and that'll be the minimum amount, so min, of total, because total is our variable that tells us how many students were enrolled and graduated in each particular major. Then we want the median, so mead equals the median of total as well and then the last one is max which equals the maximum number of graduates in our total variable so we run that code and down there in our console we can see uh, that we have the minimum number is 124 so there is a major that only graduated 124 students in the past two years, well, according to this, which was between 2010 and 2012, so maybe that's three years. Uh, however, the median, the one right in the middle was 15,000, and then we have a very large one, 393,735, uh, which again, is, it's pretty close to 400,000. Um, I highly recommend that you actually go through and figure out which majors they are. Um, hopefully you're curious. I'm curious. Uh, but this is the code we want to preserve. So we're gonna copy, paste, we'll put it in for question 1A. That will summarize my data for me. And then my minimum number, like we said, was 124. My median right in the middle was 15,104. You know, I'll put the comma there to make it look a little bit nicer. And the maximum number of graduates in a particular major is 393,735. So again, we'll preserve all of that up here in our markdown file. Okay, so back down into the console. Um, so again, if you're curious, what major did have the fewest or the most? Well, remember, it's really not that bad. Uh, we could do this really quickly because you know, we should be curious. We should be asking questions, even if it's not for a grade. Well, let's try to figure out what is actually going on. So college, recent grads. And if I want to find the biggest or the smallest, that is our range function. So a range, 
Uh, and I'll do the smallest one first. So arrange by total. And we see, ah, the smallest major up here was military technologies. Okay. And then we have a few other fairly small ones. Um, computers, mathematics, agriculture, engineering, engineering, education. Uh, so there are a few other pretty small ones there as well. And if I want to find the biggest one, we arrange, again, just hit the up arrow to uh, recall the last line you typed in your console. And we just uh, arrange it in descending order. We press enter and yep, psychology. Psychology is the most popular major uh, followed by business management. Um, and then the major biology. So uh, again, we see that we have some pretty general majors here, which are the biggest ones, which shouldn't be too surprising. Again, psychology, business, biology, um, uh, business, I got another business one, communications, and then nursing. All right. But again, what I want to figure out is what's the distribution of these numbers. Because again, I'm looking at the smallest and the largest, but what's going on with all those values in the middle? What does my distribution actually look like? So I want to create a histogram for the total number of graduates here. Um, so again, starting with college recent grads down in my console, I'm going to pipe that into, uh, if I want to make any sort of graph, that is ggplot. And then I need to define my aesthetic. So again, to see the distribution here, what I want to use is a histogram. Again, a histogram is a really great way to see the distribution of any single variable. So again, this is a single variable, so univariate data. So x equals, and again, I want to look at the total number of people. And then I need to add my layer to choose which geome I'm going to use or what kind of plot. And again, I'm going to use a geome histogram. And again, I'm going to leave it blank for now, just hit enter. And there's my plot. And again, it says it's using 30 bins. Pick a better value with bin width. So we definitely want to do that. And so up here in uh, question 1B, I said that when we create a histogram, uh, we can calculate the bin width with the following formula. The bin width is going to be equal to the maximum number minus the minimum number divided by how many bars we want to use. Uh, again, basically take that range and then divide it into how many bars we want to use. Now, typically 20 bars or fewer is acceptable for any data set, any large data set. Uh, but typically more than five bars and less than 30 bars are your guidelines for just about any other histogram. Now, again, this is not going to necessarily be an exact science. We don't have to use the exact values. Um, again, I saw that my maximum number was 393,000. So and that's close to 400,000, right? And 400,000 when compared to the minimum value 124, if I subtract those two, it's not going to be anything even really significant. And then I'll divide it by 20 because, again, I think 20 is a, a good value, although we could pick a little bit smaller if we wanted. Uh, but, yeah, we'll do 20, which gives me bins that are 20,000 apart. All right. So, so inside my geom histogram, bin width equals 20 thousand you press enter and again slightly changes my histogram just a little bit um, and we can take a look here and we see hmm looking at this distribution well, let's preserve this code because it worked let's copy and paste up here in question 1b and then what is the shape of this distribution well this distribution is pretty clearly skewed right um, again that tail goes down to the right there we can see we have a a huge peak here almost all the majors are grouped right here under 50,000 students and then we have a few bigger ones and then again we have some crazy outliers and again we saw psychology is a huge outlier here at about 40 uh, 400,000 and then we again, we had those other kind of big ones and then again everything else is much more towards that left-hand side. So if the distribution is skewed right, that means that, well, we have some extreme outliers to the right or some majors that are significantly larger than the rest. All right. 
So we know that we have some really, really large majors, but most of them are actually fairly small. So question C, 1C, I want to basically take all the majors and then classify them as small, medium, and large majors. Um, and I want roughly the same number of majors in each of those categories for small, medium, and large. And so to do this, I need to create a new variable, which is called size category or size cat. Um, that's what I'm going to call it. And I want to save this result in a new data frame called new grads. So I do want to create a new data frame. I'm not going to overwrite it and save it just yet. I want to make sure it works first, but actually that's the benefit of creating a brand new data frame. Even if it's garbage, I can get rid of it. So I am going to go ahead and start with new grads. So new grads, again, that's where I'm going to be storing the results here, but I'm starting with college recent grads and I need to pipe that into. And then again, now it's part of the order of operations thinking about how we can go about this question. And so again, I wanna categorize each of these majors as either small, medium, or large. And that category is gonna require a brand new column or a brand new variable. And so, well, if I wanna store those values somewhere, then I need that column or that variable to exist first. And so to create a new column or a new variable, that is our mutate function. So we're going to mutate this by adding that column the first argument in the mutate function when we're piping in data is going to be the name of our new cat or our name of our new um, column, which in this case is size category equals. And again, now I want it to be either small, medium, or large. So I have three different uh, possibilities here, three different options for this particular variable, which means since I'm basing it on size, I have a control flow issue with three branches. And if I were to vectorize a three branch control, pro, control flow problem, I'm using the case win function. So the case win. All right, now for the case win function, I need to create my categories and it's going to run through those categories uh, one at a time. So it'll go through the first and if the first condition is met, uh, then it will be um, assigned, well, what I tell it to assign. And so the first category, how about we start with the small one. And so we're looking at total size. So total is less than, and again, I don't know how to necessarily set this up in the beginning. So I know the median is 15,000. So I definitely know I have to be less than that. And it definitely looks like it's pretty squished there to the left. So I'm going to guess 10,000. So if the total is less than 10,000, and then the way the case win function works is that then we do the tilde, which is shift tick, which is the one next to the one button. If the total is less than 10,000, then in that column size category, I want the variable small, All right, comma. And now shift enter brings me down to that next line. So now I can type in my next, uh, my, my next category condition, I suppose. Um, and again, we want it to look nice. So again, definitely shift down. And so I'm gonna do the large category. Cause again, it's gonna go through, if it's small, it's small and it exits the whole case win thing. Uh, and now I'm gonna do large. So what does it mean to be large? Well, again, I don't know. We have some really big ones out there, but again, looking at that 50,000. Again, I'm gonna guess 50,000. Um, that's just kind of a guess now. It might not work. Again, we're gonna probably have some trial and error here. And I'm gonna make that the large category. All right, and then a comma. And then the last one would be the median, medium, sorry, the medium category, which would be in between the small and the large. And I could set up conditions that would put me between the small and the large, but the really nice part with the case win is it's gonna go through. Is it small? And if it's small, it's small and it's done. If it's not small, then is it large? And if it's large, then it's large and it's done. If it's not small and it's not large, it'll go to the next one. And I'm just gonna say true. If true is true, then make it say medium. Because, well, 
That's the only other possibility, right? That's my catch-all. That's my final catch-all to make sure that every, uh, every single observation gets a value in this particular category. All right, so I'm going to run that. And now I have in my environment over here, I have my new grads. And we can see we went from 21 variables in college recent grads to 22 variables in new grads. So we added that new column for my size category. Um, and, well, did it work? Did it look good? And again, even if I go to inspect my new one, and again, we scroll all the way to the side. Oh, size category. We do a small, medium, and large showing up. So that's good. Um, but yeah, to go through the whole thing to make sure it worked, that's, well, that's not particularly going to be useful here. So what I want to do is count how many times each of these particular observations show up to see whether or not I actually picked good boundaries or good conditions for small, medium, and large. All right, so I need to take a look at my brand new data frame I created, new grads. And I'm going to pipe that into now. Well, I want to group by my new size categories that I just created. So I'm going to group it by the size category. And then I'm going to pipe that in. So again, now R said, okay, take new grads. And we're going to group everything in that new grads data frame by the size category. So small, medium, or large. And I want to figure out how many are in each of these. So that's a summary statistic. So I want to summarize each of those and I want to summarize and say the total number. And luckily we actually have a function in R that, well, basically counts everything for us. And it's that function N. If I just do the function N, that gives the current group size. And we're going to call that inside of our summarize function. All right, so when I hit enter, I see, ah, there are for the large category, there are 36. For the medium category, there's 73. And for the small category, there's 63. All right, so we're a little off here. The, the large category is definitely too small. We need more majors in our category for large, um, which means I need to actually adjust my, my conditions a little bit. So I'm gonna hit up in my console and now that I have pulled that back up, I need to adjust my category for large. And so again, my threshold was definitely too big. It did not count enough majors. So again, this is just guessing and checking. It doesn't have to be exact. Uh, I'm gonna guess 30,000, press enter. Again, that now readjusted my new grads category. I wanna summarize how many are in there. So again, I can hit up, hit up twice to count the number. And now I have 55, 54, and 63. All right, they're all within nine of each other. So that's pretty close. That's going to be, that'll be good enough for us. That's good enough for government work. Uh, so we will keep those particular categories. All right, so the part I want to preserve is again, where I created the new grads. So I will copy and I'm going to paste that into my code block for question 1C. And how do I do, how did I define small, medium, and large? So small was less than ten thousand. Large was more than thirty thousand. And well, medium was between ten thousand and thirty thousand graduates. Again, because that's by units, right? We're talking about the number of graduates here. Okay, so now I want to see, is there a difference in the salaries if you choose a major with a lot of people uh, um, and normal and average amount of people or a smaller amount of people? And so we're going to use uh, two different visualizations. We're going to use the density plot and then we're going to use the box plot to take a look at whether there is a difference here. So now we're using our new grads data frame and I want to pipe that into, and again, ggplot because, well, I'm making some graphs here. And then I need to define my aesthetics. So my x axis, all right, so I ordered these, I grouped these all by 
sizes. But what I'm concerned about now is the median salary. I want to see whether the salary is affected by the number of students who enroll in those particular types of majors. If you pick up super popular major or a more obscure major. All right, so we'll do uh, my x-axis. Axis is the median, All right? That's my median salary from the data frame. And then I want to choose the color based upon the size category. All right, so the size category. And when I add my next layer, so the first one is geom density. So we'll start with that one. Uh, and I press enter, and there we go. We, we have a, a decent looking graph here. So what the density plot does is it's basically, it turns a histogram into a line graph for us. And so we can now compare across the different colors well, what each one looks like. And so we see that um, looks like Green, which is the medium sized major, is definitely the tallest peak. So if you choose a medium, um, a, a, a medium sized major, that is a huge peak. It means everybody's really close to the center. Um, if you pick a large major, again, that peak is roughly the same. It looks like it's a little bit to the left. So your salary would be a little bit less on average. Um, but again, seems pretty high, whereas those small majors, uh, that peak for the blue one, that peak is definitely further to the right. So you're definitely seeing larger salaries for a small major, uh, and it seems to be much more gradual. So that's what we're looking at with that one. So again, I'll press up which pulls up my last one. I will copy and I'll paste that for the density plot. And now I want my box plot. And all I'm gonna do is change geom density to geom box plot. Press enter. And now I have three separate box plots all plotted together uh, for the different types of majors. And, and we can actually see kind of the same data here using box plots uh, that we saw in our density. So. Clearly the blue has a larger maximum, is definitely shifted more to the right in terms of your median salary. Uh, of course, we have that huge outlier over here, right? That petroleum engineering that really, really, really um, is a huge outlier. Uh, luckily, box plots are resistant to outliers and those outliers are shown with little dots which means that, again, it doesn't affect the rest of the box plot having that outlier, which is good, which is why it's a very useful visualization to use. Uh, we can see that the green one is really squished up. So the box plot is, well, it shows your, your minimum at the end of the whisker. And then the middle part, the box, that's your inter, interquartile range. So your um, Q1, then your median, and your Q3. So again, it's really squished together. Uh, and then the, the maximum. And we see for the very large majors, um, again, the minimum is about the same, but the range is much wider in the interquartile range, so there's definitely more range there. And the maximum is actually quite a bit higher for the larger majors as well. So we will preserve that as well, because that is a very nice visualization. And so I'm gonna copy and paste that into question 1D. And so um, again, a density plot makes the box plot and the filters are, yeah, okay. And um, yeah, we kind of talked about what we could fill in there with the different shapes and what the interquartile ranges are. So again, pause the video, fill that in how you feel appropriate in your own words for uh, what the, the visualizations have kind of showed us about the data. All right, when you're ready, we will continue. All right, so question 1E. Now we want the summary statistics for the median of the median salary, um, which means, again, I want the one right in the middle, which is, again, that thick line in each of these. Um, and then I also want the standard deviation, because the standard deviation is going to be another numerical summary of uh, how much variation there is in the particular different major sized categories. So we're using new grads. I'm going to pipe that into... And again, I want my summary statistics, but I need to make sure that I first group by 
my size category variable. So again, I want to group by small, medium, large, pipe that into, and then I want my summary statistics. So I will summarize, and my median is going to equal the median, median of the median, which is so super confusing, but those are the variables we have to work with with this particular data set. Uh, and then I want the standard deviation. So SD equals SD of the median salary as well. And so we'll run that. And so it looks like, yes, the large major and the medium major uh, both have a median salary of 35,000. So again, that's they're right on top of each other. So again, on average, you could basically expect to make 35,000, whether you pick a large major or a small, or sorry, a large major or a medium one. Uh, but again, the smaller majors, the smaller majors are jumping way up to 40,000. But even though on average you'd expect to make more, look at the standard deviation. So the standard deviation for the small one is much, much bigger. There's much more variability by choosing a small major. Um, you might make a lot of money, and on average you will make a lot of money, but that also means that there's a lot of people who are not making a lot of money at all. There's a lot of variation. There's $14,603 of variation there. Um, and again, when we look at the box plot, the minimum value out of all of these comes from those small majors. So kind of a risk reward type situation. Again, if you're choosing your major, which one is preferable? Well, that depends on what is an acceptable level of risk for yourself. All right, so it will preserve that code, copy and paste into my summary statistics. Um, and then again, uh, write up an answer. Um, something like, again, we can see that smaller majors tend to pay more on average, but the salary is much more variable or something along those lines. And again, uh, take some time to write up a little conclusion there and, um, and, and something in your own words. All right, so once you finish with that, we're gonna start with part two. So part two, I want to find majors to either consider or avoid. All right, so we looked at the sizes of majors to see if that affects the salaries. And there's a little bit of, uh, there's definitely a little bit of effect whether you choose a bigger major or a small major. Uh, but now we wanna figure out what are the specific majors I should be considering and the specific majors I should be avoiding. And so if I avoid a major, that means it's going to pay less than average and it's going to have higher unemployment than average. And if I want to consider a major, I want it to pay more than average, but have lower than average unemployment. All right. So before I can do that, I need to figure out what is those middle values. So what's the median of median and what's the median of unemployment rate? so that I can compare those as we continue through this problem. Um, I want to store those variables as well, and I want to store those results in a numerical vector called medium unemployed grads. Um, or you could pick a better name, but that's what I'm going to use. So first of all, I need to figure out what's the median median salary and the median unemployment rate. And again, like I said, I want to store those values, but let's just make sure we can find those values first. Um, because, well, that's definitely going to be pretty important, right? All right, so the first thing I want to do, new grads, and I will pipe that in too. And, well, I'm only looking at two variables, right? The median salary and the unemployment rate. So let's only choose those two variables. So select median and select unemployment rate. And I want to pipe those in too. And now, again, I want the median value for both. The map function, the map function will apply the median function to both of those for me. All right, and that's the beauty of the map function. All right, it's going to apply that function to, well, every variable that I choose. And again, I'm only choosing two variables, but the nice part is it applies it to both. And I run it, and I see, ah, median salary, 36,000. Median unemployment rate, about 6.7%, right? We move our decimals there. All right, so that's good. Now, I know that, that seems to be working because again, those seem pretty reasonable. We looked at the graph for 
uh, median salaries, and I think 36000 pretty much about fits with what we looked at so far. Um, so I want to store these results. So go back to my last one. So map, and again, I'm going to store these results in, and I'm going to create my own new vector, which mead, so M-E-D, unemploy, the two things I'm looking at, and it is my grads one. Now, again, it'll store it as a list because by default, the map function will store things as a list, but I want a numerical vector so that I can actually uh, do some numbery stuff with it. And so I'm going to use one of the uh, functions from the map family of functions. And if I want to create a numerical vector, the map function I want to use is going to be map for the double, dbl. And so when I press enter now, I ran it. It's not going to show up in my console because instead I'm storing my results up here in my environment. And again, up in my environment, I have two new values stored in my uh, vector for medium unemployed grads. And again, we see 6.30e to the fourth. So again, that's scientific notation, 6.3 times 10 to the fourth, which is a very silly way because it would literally take less numbers to write out 36,000. But that's the way R works with his floating decimal point arithmetic for doubles. And then we see that the, again, the unemployment rate would be 6.75 times 10 to the negative two. So 6.75%. So we have everything stored there. So that's good. So again, I need to preserve that code. So copy paste and put that in for 2A. And then the median salary is $36,000. And the median unemployment rate, hanging all around here, 6.8% or so. So now I want to create a data frame called majors to avoid where we have lower than average salary and higher than average unemployment. And I'm going to use the indexed results from the, oh, spelled that wrong, from the vector we just created. So the way I'm going to do that, so my new data frame, majors to avoid. Uh, and again, I could definitely practice first before I save it, but because it's a new one, even if I make a garbage data frame, I know I can get rid of it. I don't ever want to overwrite a good one uh, until I know that it actually works though. So majors to avoid new grads. I'm going to pipe it into, well, what I want to do is filter here. I'm, I'm trying to select only particular observations that fit particular criteria. So I'm actually going to filter by two different conditions, my two different criteria. I need my median salary to be less than, uh, well, that the at average, so the 36,000. But I don't want to use the number 36,000 because if any of my data changes earlier on in my uh, analysis, right, earlier on, let's say my data frame changes at some point, 36,000 might not be the correct value. You know, for example, if 538 updates their, their data set for majors to avoid to update it, you know, 10 years down the road or whatever, my code won't be valid anymore because I use the value 36,000. Instead, if I use indexed results from the vector I just created, it's not going to matter what happens to the particular data frame. It's going to just, again, calculate this, the statistic from our previous line of code and pull that value. So we're going to use the indexed value. So the way we're going to index it, so we go to our medium unemployed grads, and the 36,000 for the median salary was stored in the first entry. So my first entry was the 36,000. So again, that is the indexed result from the vector I just created. So median unemployed grads, and I'm indexing uh, value number one, the one stored in the first value, which is the, again, the 36,000 over here. And which is a single ampersand here, because these are just uh, two different comparison operators. And then I also want the unemployment rate, unemployment rate to be higher than or greater than, and again, instead of the 6.8%, and I would have to round, so it wouldn't even be precise anyway, I want it to be less than the indexed result, but now in place number two. All right, and so I run that, 
and I get, ah, majors to avoid, 44 observations with my 22 variables. So again, I preserved all 22 variables, but now there's only 44 majors that I should probably be avoiding. All right, so that sounds about right. Again, remember there was 172 majors to begin with. Narrowing it down to 44 seems pretty appropriate. And again, there's 44 majors to avoid. Part C, we are doing the same question, but in reverse. What major should I consider? So my new data frame now, instead of majors to avoid, is majors to consider. And I want to filter, but again, now I want the opposite. So instead of a smaller than average salary, I need a bigger than average salary. And instead of a bigger than average unemployment rate, I want a smaller than average unemployment rate. And when I run this, Ah, I get a new data frame for majors to consider that has 44 observations. So there's 44 majors that I should be considering. And we will preserve that code as well. And 46 majors to consider. All right, now, if at any point during this, um, I've, I'm going too fast, don't forget, you can always pause this video and make sure you're uh, keeping along with me. All right, so now I want to inspect these two, no, two new data frames. And again, there's a bunch of ways I could do this. Uh, but again, the nice part about RStudio is that I can literally just click this and view. So for majors to avoid, and that opens it up here. Uh, let's see, we have majors to avoid environmental science, communications, criminal justice, commercial art and design, communications and journalism. Physiology, Criminology, Nutrition Sciences, uh, Computer Technologies, Interdisciplinary, Forestry, History, History is one to avoid, Biology, Sociology, oh, so Biology is up there to avoid as well, and I think Communications is up there too. And we keep going through, Psychology is one to avoid, Music is one to avoid, so... Yeah, and the nice part is, again, we also have our major categories. So again, there's lots of different majors, but if I kind of scroll through here, okay, communications, I'm seeing a couple of those, humanities and liberal arts, humanities and liberal arts, humanities and liberal arts, psychology and social work, humanities and liberal arts. So, ooh, and if I'm thinking about majors to avoid, I think anything in the humanities would be something to avoid. And again, that is not any sort of personal uh knock on the humanities. In fact, I love the humanities. I, I love to study the humanities. I love to read the classics. I love to study philosophy. That's uh, most of what I do in my free time involves the humanities. And I, and I love art as well. And I love music. Um, but am I going to make any money by doing that? No. Am I going to be able to find a job doing that? No. So again, the humanities are amazing things to study just don't pay money to do it. You don't have to pay someone to study the humanities. You literally just have to read the books that the humanities are based off of or make some music. Um, and then majors to consider. Again, I can click on that and take a look. Let's see, engineering, 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 physical sciences, engineering, 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 and even the physical sciences is astronomy. Uh, law and public policy, computers, engineering, you got some business, engineering, business, engineering, computers and math, computers and math, got some health, health ones up there too, computers and math, agriculture, health, engineering. Ah, so looks like there are some humanities degrees and this one, U.S. history actually fits that particular category. Um, and, uh. Yeah, some biology ones as well. But if you notice, biology was in a major to avoid. So avoid biology, but wait a second. We have these other biology degrees that we should be considering, but the difference is the biology degrees to consider are all specialized. A general degree in biology is fairly worthless unless you have some specialization to go along with it. And a specialization like microbiology or botany or even adding chemistry or doing genetics. Those are all worthwhile, but just a general degree in biology probably is not going to get you a job in the future. So we take a look and, um, well, you take a look yourself and summarize. I want you to write your own summary 
for question 2D. What patterns did you notice? And again, I told you some of them. And um, so what major types would you try to avoid? And what major types would you think to consider? All right. So again, pause, write up your conclusion. Make sure you actually fill that out. And then we will continue on with the last part, part three, looking at the most popular major category. All right. So first of all, I need to figure out, well, what is the most popular major category? What is the major category with the most number of graduates? So again, we'll take our new grads data frame that we just created. I want to what do I want to do with that? Well, I want to figure out what is the most popular major category, which means the first thing I need to do is group this data or group by the major category. So major category. So group it by the major categories and then pipe that into, well, again, I want to kind of group them all together. So um, I want everything that falls under engineering to be grouped together or summed together. So that's a summary statistic. So I need to summarize now. And the total in each major category is going to be the sum of all the total majors, um, all the total different majors that, well, fall into that particular group. And I don't necessarily have to do this one, but I, I want to because I want to see the whole thing in order. So I am going to arrange my data to make it look nicer. And I'm going to arrange in descending order because, again, I want the biggest one. And it is by, again, that, that total. I'm making my summary statistic be total. Um, and so I run. And out of my 16 different major categories, ah, business is at the top. So 1.3 million students graduated with a degree in business. Everything is about business, isn't it? Uh, the next biggest one, humanities and liberal arts, which might have something to do with why you want to avoid those majors, um, was next up with 700,000. So almost, well, a, a bit over half. Um, so <laughs> business is just under double the size of the next closest major category. Then after that is education, and then after that is engineering. Then comes our social science, and then all the way down towards the bottom, we see the smallest ones are interdisciplinary, um, which, again, could mean a lot of different things. And then before that, agriculture and natural resources, which, again, that might have something to do with why the agricultural degrees uh, end up actually paying more than everything else. Not enough people are going into farming, and it turns out everybody eats every day, multiple times a day. That food's got to come from somewhere. Someone's got to make sure it grows, right? So there we go. The most popular major category is clearly business. So I will copy and paste, preserve that code in question 3A. The major category with the most graduates is busyness. All right. Question 3B. So I want to create a new variable called is business that either says true or false, depending on whether or not the major is considered a in the, the business uh, major category. All right, so I do want to overwrite the original data frame, but I don't want to do it yet. Remember, I don't want to overwrite anything until I'm sure my code is working effectively. So we'll start with new grads again, and I'm going to pipe that in, and I want a new variable. So a new variable, if I want a new variable or a new column, think back to part one, the function I need to use first is my mutate function. So I want to mutate, which means I want to add my column. I want to add my variable. I have in there that my new variable should be called is busyness, is business equals. And so I want it to be either true or false. So again, this is a control flow issue. Um, but there's only two branches, and when there's only two branches, the best control flow option to use is going to be the if, oops, if else function. All right, so the if underscore else um, function, that's what I want to use here. And the first part of my if else is my condition statement. And so my condition statement is based upon the major category. 
if the major category, I want to see, I basically want to check each one of my observations, each one of the majors, and check to see whether or not the major category equals busyness. All right. So the condition becomes my first argument in my if else statement. All right. Then after that, I need to put what is going to happen if it's true and what's going to happen if it's false. Now, in this case, I'm literally setting it up so that it is true and false. So my column is going to be true if it's true and false if it's false. I'm going to use the logicals. I'm, I'm, I'm breaking this down to the Booleans. Zeros and ones, trues and falses, yeses and nos. Um, and again, the way the if else function works, it goes uh, your condition, then what happens if it's true, then what happens if it is false? And again, I'm just saying true is true and false is false. Um, and let's just double check to make sure that actually kind of works. And of course, okay, I can't actually see because look how big that data frame is, but I do see my tibble has 172 rows, so that's good. Um, 23 variables, which is one more. So I did add that one column. Hopefully it worked, but we'll have to check that in a minute. And so I will be confident in myself and I will overwrite new grads with this. So boom, new grads. And then again, I'm going to double check. And again, that's a really nice part about our studio, right? We have up here in my environment, new grads. I check, I scroll all the way over. Ah, false, 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 false. Uh, one of them is true. So I keep my eye on that and I go over. Oh yeah, actuarial sciences and business. Good. Okay, so that looks like it absolutely worked. So since it worked, we will preserve it. So hit up twice, get my line of code and copy and paste. All right. So now I want to create a brand new data frame that only has the majors from the business category. And again, the nice part is I set up my new column that said is business is either going to be true or false. So I just want the ones from that category that are going to be true. So my new data frame business grads. All right, that's where I want to store it. It's coming from my new grads data frame piped in. And all I'm doing in this case is I'm trying to filter and checking the variable is business, is business equal, remember double equals, to true. I run it. Now I have business grads. I can check 13 observations of the 23 variables. And yes, sure enough, uh, everything is in the business major category. Um, and so it looks like there's 13 different majors that count as a business major. So let's preserve that code. So the business grads, copy and paste that into question 3C. And then what is the highest paying major in that business grads data frame? So we'll start with our business grads data frame that we just created. Pipe that into, and I want the highest paying. So biggest or lowest means arranging. So I will arrange, and I want the highest one, so arrange in descending order. Um, all right, well, it looks like I got an extra set of parentheses there. Clean that up. And I want to arrange it in descending order according to salary, which is my median variable. All right, so I will run that. And the one at the top, actuarial sciences. Um, again, Hard to tell whether or not that worked because look at all those extra variables. Shoot. All right. So I'll tell you what, before I arrange it, let's only select the ones we want to make sure that we can actually see if my code worked. So we want to select, of course, major. We know all the major categories are business. Um, maybe we will take a look at the total and definitely the median. Um, and then unemployment rate is another good one. Because again, we want to consider, uh, again, most of those variables when it comes to choosing a major. So, and again, four should fit nicely enough that I can actually see what's going on. Okay, so, uh, closure, not a subset. Ah, I made a silly, silly mistake. I made a silly, silly mistake because I forgot to pipe. 
Silly, silly me. Once I select, I need to still pipe that into my range function. There we go. No, no error messages there. So the number one is actuarial sciences with only less than 4,000 people graduating uh, as actuaries, but they are all making $62,000. Their unemployment rate though is almost 10%. So again, there's that risk reward showing up again. You can make a lot of money, but it might be harder to find a job. Um, and then after actuarial sciences, we have uh, MIS and statistics, operations, logistics, finance, business econ, accounting, and then about halfway down the list, now we have general business, international business, miscellaneous business, which, okay. Um, then management, marketing, human resources, and then lastly, hospitality. So human resources and hospitality, you're not gonna get paid much, uh, but human resources has a very low unemployment rate of less than 6%. So uh, they always need people who are willing to be in HR because you don't get paid much, and I bet that's not a very fun job, but I wouldn't actually know myself. All right, so I will preserve that code because it worked as I wanted it to. What is the highest paying major? It is actuarial sciences. So the last one to summarize up this whole project, this whole lab today, I want you to Google that highest paying major. So look up actuarial sciences. Um, you might actually already know what an actuary is or what an actuary does, but I want you to actually look it up. Look up actuarial sciences. And for example, search actuarial sciences at CCSU or, or UConn. And I want you to look at the uh, description of what the major is and then the courses required. So particularly take a look at what subject those courses are from. What's the, the subject code? So, um, you know, for example, English is like ENG. History is HIS. Math is MAT or, or math, M-A-T-H. Um, all those different types of courses. What kind of courses are involved? Uh, how many of those courses are actually business courses? And does that even belong in the business degree? I don't know. Either way, that is your final part to finish up this lab. Hopefully that all goes pretty well. Feel free to email me with any questions you have. When you finish up this lab and you have all of your answers, don't forget to, well, first of all, uh, change the header, put your name, update the date to whatever day you actually do it. Then knit it as a PDF to make it look all nice and pretty. Save that PDF to your local machine and email it to me so that I have it as well. All right. Hopefully that went pretty well. And uh, yeah, take care, take care of yourself, guys.